Good evening, friends. Happy to be back in the house of the Lord again tonight in the service of the great King. It's been a wonderful day. Had fellowship with many of our brethren this morning, had, had a, having breakfast with them, and just had a wonderful time enjoying this day greatly. And now, tonight, to get right straight, as quick as we possibly can, we're just a, a little late, and beginning at 8 o'clock is what throws me off. <laughs> I think that's pretty late at home, and last, usually I speak just a little long because I try to get just as much in as I can, knowing we just got five nights and two nights after this, and it's not long enough. We, if we had about two weeks, see, the first thing you have to get used to each other as I used to say, get all the spooks away, <laughs> where we won't be afraid of each other and know that we're not here to harm one another, we're here to help one another. And so then usually a person, when they're healed too, oh, right away they're just feeling marvelous. And now if you don't know the approach of how to hold that healing, it'll come right back and you'll be worse than you was the first time. See? Now, sickness is the devil. We know that. You can't pin that on God. God don't make people sick. God makes people well. And so you, the Bible said when the unclean spirit's gone out of a man, he walks in dry places and returns again with seven other devils, worse than he was. Now, if the good man of the house isn't there to keep him off and know the very attack that he's going to make, then it's worse. Just like a growth. It's a life. It's got a life in it. That life is a growing like a cancer. It develops from one little cell. You develop from one cell. You come from a blood cell to your father. And that was a blood cell. And it went into the womb, and there it began to multiply cells. And it brought forth the child. It grew into the size person you are now. Tear it down and go right down to one cell. Then ask what's after that one cell? Is a life. That life is a spirit. Your spirit come from God. But where did that cancer, which is developing cells, where did it come from? It come from one cell. But what's behind that cell is another life. And what life is that? A life of death. God can't be a, life can't be associated with death. They don't agree. Jesus never preached the funeral. Death and life can't stay together at the same time. See? So they come from the devil. Then when that we're not dealing with that growth. We're dealing with the life in that growth that's making it grow. And when that life goes out, it shrinks. When anything dies, it actually shrinks. How many of you ever killed a wild animal, a deer, or anything? Let's see your hand. All right? You weigh it as soon as you kill it. And just let it lay there and tell the boys how much it weighs. And in the morning, weigh it again. See how far off you are. It shrinks. An undertaker will be here telling you the same thing about a human body. When you die, it begins to break down. They tell you it's got an artificial eye or teeth. They take them out because they'll push out. But then, it's like a little animal run over in the street, a little dog or something. But leave him lay there for about 72 hours and watch what takes place. He's way bigger than he was the first time. See, it shrinks, then he goes to swelling. Well, as soon as that growth begins to swell in the patient, the patient says, oh, I'm so sick. Oh, I'm so sick. I lost my healing. And that's the sign you got your healing. Yeah. <laughs> you just got it by subversive. And I suppose in the afternoon service they're teaching those things anyhow. So... In the big campaigns, we try to get that in. And in my tent, I'm going to try to do it myself in the afternoon service, give the instructions of how to approach, how to maintain your healing. Just as much know how to maintain it as to receive it. And then if you don't, it's like salvation. You accept Christ, and the first thing you know, immediately the devil takes. How many here is born again? Let's see your hand. Praise the Lord for that. How many was tempted and went through temptation immediately after you was born again? Let's see your hand. Every one of you. Sure. If you didn't, you wasn't born again. So you've got to have every son that cometh to God's first got to be chastised, child trained. No exception. Every son. Every person that comes without exception. Well, then what happens? This growth begins to break up. If it's a growth on the inside of you, the impurities, it'll give you a fever. Sure it will, because the heart's got to beat that through and purifies the bloodstream. And certainly you've got to get worse right away. But you won't get worse for about 72 hours because that's when corruption sets in. And it's just like if you was a cancer and go to take you off the earth, you wouldn't deal with the way of healing just to, uh, to, to take your body away, just take the life out of it and it'll automatically go away. So that's the main thing is we're dealing with the spirit. In my name they shall cast out demons. The devil. 
Now, a lot of times we have a person like death that came here. Well, the doctors say if there's any operation he can do, if a bone's been pulled out of place, like in, sometimes losing the teeth or pull the jaw in and cut the bone, cut the nerve rather, he can't hear. The doctor sometimes in the operation can correct that. But what if there's nothing there that he can't tell what done? Just like a, my hand's turning black and blue. They can't understand why. It's got a transparent band around it here, shutting off the circulation. That's why the hand will die. If the doctor, the only thing he can work on is what he can see or feel. That's all he can do. But what if it's a spirit in there? He can't see it, feel it, no way to contact it, only in the supernatural. Well, they say that's the same thing about hearing. They say he's just deaf. Well, what makes him deaf, doctor? The nerves died in his ear. Well, what made him die, doctor? They didn't die all over him. So just why did he die in the ear? Now, the Bible said it's a deaf spirit. The Bible said right. it's a deaf spirit. And when the deaf and dumb kept, see, the deaf and dumb spirit came out of the man, he could speak and hear. See? It's a spirit. What happens? That transparent man that our physicians and working in the, on the anatomy, what they have been trained to work on, they can't find it. They know the nerve went dead, but what made it go dead? That's the next thing. Now, the Bible said it's the devil. All right, when you get that thing released, first thing you're going to get feeling in there, and, well, your hand will be all right. If nature isn't interrupted, every cell will produce just exactly of its kind. It's, it's all has to be of the devil. All sickness. Remember, before we had any sickness, we had no sin. And sickness is an attribute of sin. When sin came in, sickness followed it. And so sickness is to shorten your days. And it's of the devil. And some people, those people, if you ever hear people say, it's such a blessing, God makes people sick so that he can bless them. Uh, That's thinner than a broth made out of a shadow of a chicken that starved to death. Or, or don't you never believe such a thing as that. That's not scripture. If it is, Jesus Christ defeated his own purpose when he came to the earth and healed them of the sick and afflicted. He came to the earth to defeat exactly what he came to do then. So see, that, that won't hold water. <laughs> No, sir. It's, no, sir. Jesus came to rid sickness and to rid sin and to rid every act. And you can't, you can't deal with sin in any manner unless you're dealing with sickness. That's right. Now, he just didn't die for one strike that made him for sickness and the other for salvation. It was all through giving us salvation. He, he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes, we were healed. Just like if a big serpent had his foot in me, and was tearing my side out, there's no need to cut his foot off, and arguing whether I can cut his foot off or not, just knock him in the head, it kills the whole thing. <laughs> so that's what it is about sickness and sin. If you knock sin in the head, you kill the whole thing. That's all, because it's just an attribute of it. And so that's the way it is, and we must understand how to approach it. And now you pastors here, just remember, last night especially, after I left the platform, you'll find out that after I'm gone a long time, You'll find out women and men will be testifying to you that they're healed and they don't know it. That's right. At last I could, while well, I was so weak, I, for a long time, as the service is over, and I know that many things happen that the people hasn't found it out yet. But it's true. Now, quickly to the word, and I know I'm holding you too long because my wife told me so. <laughs> and said, so you're sorry. Uh... Pastor Jose want to know if, if I'd ask everybody if they could hear all right. Can you hear all right? Can you hear up in this side? Over here, they can, can you hear over here? Or back in the back of the main auditorium, can you hear all right? If you step it up just a little bit back there, everyone who's doing the engineering. And now, quickly, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us in his word. And then we'll go right straight to the healing service. Heavenly Father, we stand in thy august presence here now tonight to bow our heads, to express to thee the very adoration of our heart. We love thee with unchangeable love. Twenty-five years ago you placed that divine love in my heart for the Lord Jesus, and it grows sweeter every day. I'm so happy that we grow in the Lord till we become in the full statue, the measure and statue of Christ. And today we see through a dark glass, but when we see him face to face, then we'll know as we are known. And here we have troubles and trials with the attributes of our salvation being so dear to us. But someday when life is over, 
It does not yet appear just what kind of a body we'll have, but we know we'll have a body like his own glorious body, for we shall see him as he is. And then we'll have no more prayer for the sick, no more sermons to the sinners, but it'll all be over. And Father, why it's called the day, let us walk, for the night cometh when no man can work. We ask that in Christ's name that he'll take over this service tonight and deal with hearts and be in the Word and encourage people, Father, to believe. For in thy beloved Son's name we ask it. Amen. This blessed Word of God, which I do love to read, I want to read a portion out of Romans, the fourth chapter, the 18th verse. And against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, this, 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 and the promise should be made, be fulfilled. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. May the Lord add his blessings now to his word. Be hearing good reports today of the things that's happened in our little meeting here in this little congregation, as small as it is, gathered, yet the Holy Spirit has met with us and blessed us. Now, we're speaking tonight upon faith. And I thought it would be nice maybe if we would uh, use this great character of Abraham for an example of faith because it was to Abraham the promise was given. And we'll kind of review the life of Abraham just a little because he was an outstanding character. And he was a man who believed God. And now he had no great backgrounds to believe God because it's commonly believed that he was from a family of idolaters. He came down from Babylon, his family, dwelt in the land of Chaldea, the city of Ur, the valleys of Shinar, and was just an ordinary man. He wasn't no angel, he was just a man like you and I. And God looking over the earth to see for a man that he could put confidence in that would believe him regardless of circumstances, he found Abraham and called Abraham by election. Now, I want you to notice, this might take just a short time. I've got my watch before me, so I won't go too long. God... The infant, eternal, immortal God knows everything from the beginning. He knows the end. When there was a cycle like a, a panoramic going around, and it's a perfect circle, that's eternity. There's no end to a perfect circle. You start on top of this platform tonight, you could bowl right through to the ground, all the way through the ground, out into the earth, and uh, through the earth, and out into space, you'd still have a perfect circle. And that's the way eternity is, just endless. And then when Satan upset this program, there was a little a block started back there, and it just dropped down. And it comes along for a certain space, and it's called time. Then it goes back again. Now, it doesn't cease to be eternity. Some people say that we will be in eternity. We are now in eternity. Eternity just drops down into a time limit. But it moves on. Christ standing back at the beginning, at the end when it started, he foresaw everything that would be, and he just come down to redeem the sinner and to bless us and went up and standing at the other end of the road, making a blessed old highway across the way, that scarlet streak of the blood, and some glorious day will take a hold where she's tied to eternity or time to time and we'll give it a full and a church will be lifted out and eternity will roll on just the same. <laughs> he knowed all things. He had to be, to be infant, the immortal. And back there, when he saw that it would take 
something great. He had the program in his own mind when he seen that Satan had... Now, Satan cannot create. Satan can only pervert what God has created. And sin... Listen. Sin is only righteousness perverted. Did you ever think of that? Anything that's sin... For you to be married and live with a wife, that's exactly what God said. But to be immoral is pervert. It's the same act, but it's to pervert what God has made right. right. See? And all sin is righteousness perverted. And Satan perverts what God has made. Right. And he made you to be a son or a daughter to him, and Satan perverted you. See? Change your way of thinking. Change your mind, change your appetite, change your desire. And what a good mess he's made out of the nations today. When I think of how the nations have become so polluted. I'm speaking of ours in the U.S. All we got down there is people with their heads sticking into televisions and radio and this old silly music of rock and rolls and all kind of stuff like that. It's of the devil. Of the devil. And men and women will stay home from a prayer meeting to go and listen to that woman, Lucy, or Sister Lucy, or, or some kind of silly thing. And what is it? I've got the crime record going myself right from the files of the FBI, which is I have in my own possession that all, nearly 90% of that, they're married four or five times and caught on the street and filth and honoring it. And you stick your head to look at that, it shows what's in the heart. A real born-again child of God loves the Word and stays with the Word and with the Bible. God help you Canadians. Don't never let that American pollution get in here. And that's right. Where did it come from? Where do you get it from America? Where did America get it from Hollywood? Where did Hollywood get it from hell? Exactly. So it's that. Oh, look what it stripped all women. It's made him mall everywhere. The whole world's become a conglomeration of, of immorality. I heard the other day that some mayor down in Florida was going to pass a law that women had to dress uh, all the way from the neck to the knees to come on the street. I'll move to Florida if it is. Yes, sir. I'm so tired. You look this way and that way. Everything is immoral. I had a little crucifix hanging up in front of my car. Some fellow was riding with me the other day. He said, hey, Brother Graham, I thought you was a Protestant. I said, I am. He said, that's Catholic. I said, when did the Catholics have the option on the cross? That's the symbol of Christian faith. Little saints, dead people, like St. Cecilia and all them, them dead people at Catholic Spray That's the sign of Catholicism, not the cross. Christ raised from the dead. Right. Yes. And I said, I see so much evil on the street. When I see that evil, I look at the cross and think, Oh, God, how I love you for saving me from such corruption. That's right. Let him always be before our faith. Now, Abraham was called by election. Abraham is election. Isaac is justification, Jacob is grace, and Joseph is perfection. Now, in the beginning, when God called Abraham, he called him not because he was a good man, but because God foreknew Abraham. God knew what Abraham would do. He knew Abraham. He said, I know that Abraham will raise his children to fear the Lord. God knew him. God knows you. That's the reason we, as Congressman Upshaw used to say, we can't make ourselves something that we hate. That's right. That's right. No matter how much you try to impersonate, you can't do it. It's the sovereign grace of God that calls you. And Abraham was called by the grace and by election. And when he was called, when he was received his call, he was given the covenant of God, not because he was a good man, but it was given unconditionally to him. Now, this is going to hurt legalist believers just a little bit now. I don't mean to pinch, but we want to know the truth, see. There's nothing that a man can do to save himself. You are already saved by grace. Right. You can't stop eating meat. You can't stop doing this. You can't stop. There's nothing you can do. Christ saves you in that alone. That's right. 
You can't even come to him unless he chooses you first. He said, you never chose me, but I chose you. And no man can come to me except the Father draws him first. And all that comes, I'll give him everlasting life and raise him up at the last day. Man, that's that it. Oh, my, that will make the Methodists get happy. <laughs> Think of it. What, not what we are, but what Christ is for us. Christ become you and I, that you and I might become him. He taken our sins that we might take his righteousness. So it's nothing in my arms I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Nothing I could do, nothing you could do, it's the grace of God. Then God tried man one time and made a covenant with man upon a condition. If you will not touch this tree, then you will live forever. And man broke his covenant. Man just can't keep his promise to God. His adversary is too great. And God, knowing that, he was determined to save man, so he made the covenant unconditionally. Oh, brother, the trouble of it is with the full gospel people tonight, you're scared. Of, how can anything happen to you? How can those who he foreknew, he predestinated? Those who he has predestinated or foreknew, he called. Those who he called, he has justified. And those who he has justified, he has already glorified. So quit being scared. God's the one driving the ship. Not you and I. We just to stay on it. <laughs> Amen. God made a promise, God keeps his promise. Yes. No matter how ridiculous it seems, God keeps it. And he met Abraham, and he gave him the covenant, now not Abraham, if you will do certain things, I'll do certain things. He said, I have already passed tense, it's already settled. I've already made the covenant with Abraham, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to bring you home with your fathers at a ripe old age, nothing you can do about it, I've already done it. You say, Brother Branham, if I only had God to say that to me, wait a minute. God said, Abraham and his seed after him. That's a good word. Hallelujah. (laughs) Means praise our God. That's true. We are the seed of, how we come the seed of Abraham. When we join the church, no, sir. When we're baptized, no, sir. How do you become the seed of Abraham? We be dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed and our heirs according to the promise. And the same faith that Abraham had comes to us by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason you can believe in divine healing and call those things which are not as though they were, because God said so. That settles it. Abraham was 75 years old when the Lord called him, and Sarah, his wife, was 65. And he said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of nations, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you a baby. To a man, 75, and a woman, 65. Uh, could you imagine a man, 75 years old, taking his little wife with a hand, her 65, toddling down the street and going to a doctor and say, Doctor, we want to make ready now. We're going to have a baby. The doctor would say, <coughs> well, <coughs> yes, sir, uh-huh. Well, what's your address? Uh, where do you live? You have the psychopathic group up there at you right away. <laughs> sure. Let's say he's just a little bit off. I hear it is. Every person that takes God at his word to the world is considered a little bit off. That's right. You're just peculiar. The Lord said you are. And if you're not, you're not here. That's right. That's kind of rough, isn't it? But that's the word. <laughs> That's what you got to stay with. No other foundation, but this is already laid. So Abraham, could you imagine Sister Sarah going downtown and getting the pins and the bullseye and getting everything ready to have the baby, 65-year-old woman? And Abraham said, well, we're going to have the baby, all right. God said so. Well, I imagine it lost his friends when I said, poor fella, you know what? Uh, it is something wrong with him. Look at that old couple toddling down the street saying they're going to have a baby and we know that they've lived together since she's about 18 and he's about 28. 
and they got married when she was just a girl. They lived together all this time, and yet here they are saying they're going to have a baby. You know, I believe their age has got the best of them. They're kind of slippery. This must be a real hot summer. The weather's got them down or something. But it didn't make any difference what anybody said. Abraham had God's promise. That makes the difference. It's who made the promise. Is that right? And he made it to Abraham, the chosen. It's the promise of who it's made to. Now, the promise of God is just as real tonight to the seed of Abraham as it was to Abraham. He's the same God. You know, I feel pretty religious right now. I really do. Think of it. That would make a Baptist shout. Why? Because God has promised. And by grace are we called. And when we receive Christ as personal Savior, a man said to me the other day, he said, Now, wait a minute, Brother Dan, you're getting away from your Baptist doctrine when you go to say receiving the Holy Ghost. said, We receive it when we believe. I said, Then why did Paul say, Have you received it since you believe? That's right. Acts 19. I said, I want to ask you something. said, You were preaching on Abraham. And Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. said, The only thing he can do is believe. What else can a person do but believe? And God imputed it to him for righteousness because he believed. I said, that's true. But he gave him the seal of circumcision as a confirmation of his belief. Right. I said, if you haven't received the Holy Ghost yet, God's never recognized your faith. And the, and the Holy Ghost is the seal of God. Ephesians 4, 30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed Amen. until the next revival. Oh, <laughs> uh, to your eternal destination. Amen. How long? Forever. Right. God send it once for all. And now you're the seed of Abraham. And if you're not deceived in your experience, that same spirit with Abraham is in the seed of Abraham. And you believe God. That make it hard on preachers that don't believe in divine healing, but that's what the Bible said. Right. And when you become a son of God, I take the nature of my father because I am his son. And Abraham believed God and received the circumcision as a seal of the promise that was to come. And now we have received the promise itself, right. the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwelling in the man makes him a son of God, and he believes like God believes. Right. What did I say? <laughs> he believes like God believes. And what did God, how did God make the world? Hebrews 1. He made it out of things he had nothing to make it with. Right. He just said, let there be. And he believed his word. And the very ground that you're sitting over tonight is nothing else but the Word of God made manifest. If it isn't, where did he get the material to make it with? Where did it come from? God spoke his Word and believed his Word. And Abraham took God's Word at the impossible and it was made possible. Mary the Virgin took God at his word and the impossibles was made possible. The whole course of life was changed and she brought forth a baby knowing no man because she took God at his word. And if anybody will take God at his word, his word will be made manifest. And if that seed falls on the right kind of a ground, it will produce exactly what it's said to do. Put me on record for this. On these tapes that's going on. The right mental attitude towards any divine promise of God will bring it to pass. If you'll look at it right and realize who made it. Now, if you've never had the Holy Spirit, no man can even call Jesus a Christ only by the Holy Spirit. Oh, you say, you might say the preacher said so. I read the Bible, that's all true. But you don't know it yourself until you've experienced it. The Bible said that you can't know that Jesus is the Christ only by the Holy Spirit. That's right. So you see, that's the seed of Abraham, and the same promise that was made to Abraham has been made to you. And Abraham took God at his word, and what God said, Abraham told every other thing wrong, and was against hope. There wasn't even a hope, yet believed in hope. And called those things which were not as though they were, because God said so. Now, if you're dying with a cancer, if you're blind, if you're crippled, whatever you have, God promised to heal. And accept 
life is there a total thing. You say, I don't know any better. Quit looking at that. The seed of Abraham, don't look at, at the condition. They look at who said the word. God said so. People take symptoms. Always look at the oh, I was paid for it. My hand is crippled. I know better. And you'll never be no better as long as you look at your hand. <laughs> Here some time ago, I stood by a dying child. It's been about eight years ago. Boy, about 12 years old. An old father sent for me to come. And I said, well, sir, in these meetings, he said, well, Graham, my baby is dying. And he said, I'm an old man, my only son. He said, if you will come and pray for him, Brother Branham. I said, well, I'm, I'm just sure I've been to eat a big dinner. I said, no, 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 no. He said, just come pray the prayer. I believe in you, Brother Branham. I went down to the hospital, and the doctor said, who's this? And he wouldn't let me in. So I kept talking to him. Finally, he let me go. I said, the boy's dying. He's unconscious. been unconscious two days, sir. I said, look, I said, boy, the man was a Catholic. I said, if I was a priest and he was a, a Catholic boy, would you let me in and give him the last right? He said, well, that's different. I said, no, it's not. Not a bit different. We believe, and this old man believes, that if I pray for his boy, he'd get well. He said, go on. So he set me back there, and we got down the side of the bed. The boy's unconscious. I laid hands upon him and said, Heavenly Father, this man has believed you. And I come just as a witness that I believe with him to lay my hands upon the boy in commemoration of your word, saying, If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. I believe you, Lord. He believes you. Now we commit it to you. And the old fellow raised up crying. He ran across and grabbed his wife and kissed her and said, Oh, honey, isn't it wonderful? She said, Oh, dear, it's so wonderful. The little nurse down there scratched her head. She said, How can you all act like that and this boy dying? Well, the old man wiped the tears from his eyes. He said, Madam, the boy's not dying. Oh, she said, Sir, he is dying. And it's some kind of a, something he had black diphtheria. And this is one, that's the reason he didn't want me to go in because afraid I'd pack diphtheria to my boy <laughs> and my own child. And I said, If I had that kind of faith, I ain't got no business in here anyhow. So I said, Just let me in. I'll take responsibility for that. So the old man was just rejoicing. And the lady said, Look, that heart is slow, some kind of a cardiogram, something. If it ever goes down, it never comes back again. I'll never forget what the old man said. He put his arm around that little nurse. He said, look, sister dear, said, I'm not disputing your word. He said, see, the only thing that you have to look at is that machine. So that's all you're taught to look at is that machine. In the medical and scientific research that I have, that's wonderful. We all appreciate that and thank God for it. But said, the only thing you're looking at is that machine. So that's all you got to look at. But said, I'm looking at a divine promise. That God promised to do it. Amen. And that boy's married and got a wife and child. <laughs> sure, laid back that for another day. Well, once that thing began to come up again, it had never been known. He said, in all the world's history for it to do it, it depends on what you're looking at. <laughs> See, if you look at your hand, don't look at that, look at God's promise. God said so. And if God said so, that settles it. Amen. It's always like with the seed of Abraham. They believe it to be the truth. Now, and people still look at symptoms. They'll be prayed for many times. Symptoms are a great thing that you should ignore. The Bible said, here, if anybody had symptoms, it was Jonah. How many remembers the story of Jonah? Now, that man had a right to have symptoms. Now, look, he was, he was backslid because the Lord told him to do something he wouldn't do it. He took the easy road. And he was backslid out on a stormy sea. And was, they tied his hands and feet. And threw him out of the ship, and a big fish swallowed him the whale. And anyone knows that when a fish feeds, then he goes down to the bottom and rests his swimmers on the bottom. I don't know how many fathoms deep it was out there, but Jonah was backslid, hands and feet tied, in the bed of the whale on the stormy sea, at the bottom of the sea, with seaweeds wrapped around his neck, and in the vomit of the whale. If you look this way, it was whale's belly. That way it was whale's belly. Every whale looked as whale's belly. You talk about symptoms, he had them. You're not in that bad of shape. But you know what Jonah said? Jonah said, they are lying vanities. I won't even look at them. But he said, once more, Lord, will I look to your holy temple. When Solomon dedicated that temple, he said, Lord, if our people be in trouble anywhere and look to this holy place and pray, then hear from heaven. And... Jonah, believing that God heard Solomon's prayer and God put oxygen 
from her and kept that man alive for three days and nights and took him a fish right, right straight over to Nineveh and put him over there to prophesy. Right. And if Jonah, under those circumstances, could believe that and refuse to look at anything that was contrary to God's program, you're not in that bad of shape. Right. How much more ought you to look tonight, not to a temple made with man's hands, not to an earthly temple, but to a heavenly temple where Christ, the Son of God, with his bloody garment, stands before God the Father tonight to make intercession upon any confession that you make in his rejected blessings and clean man. How much more ought you to say, I won't look at nothing but God's eternal promise. I tell you, the God of heaven that kept Joel alive three days and nights can carry you to the deepest of God. Amen. 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 There you are. It depends on what you're looking at. Once more, I look at our temple as Abraham believed God. He didn't say what the outlook was. Well, sure, it was impossible. Sixty-five years old, she was, she was about twenty-five years past menopause. So it's impossible. But Abraham wasn't looking at the impossible. He was looking at what God said. And he was making ready for it. Oh, I, I feel good. Look, he was looking at what God said. He didn't care what anybody else said. He looked what God said. And he refused anything else. Oh, my. Can you do it? Do you believe it? That faith really is going in here. Well, how much greater covenant have we tonight? How much more of the thousands of years of witnesses that prove God over and over and over and over and then him come right down in the midst of his head and prove that he's here? Seeing heal him, bring him from wheelchairs, make the blind to see the deaf to hear. And then we poor little weakens calling ourselves Christians and a faint and fall away to some little something. Why, it's a spineless a jellyfish. Certainly. What do you want? God's word, if God said so, that settles it. I can see Abraham say, well, say it. Praise God, we're going to have it. She said, yes, Abraham, honey, I believe you. Here, that's a good couple. Well, after the first month passed, I hear Abraham say, Honey, how you feel? No different. Bless God, we're going to have it anyhow. <laughs> sure. Another month passed. What about Sarah? No different, honey. Glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. Right. Why? Right. God said so. First year passed. Any difference said? No different. You're over. How are you? We're going to have it anyhow. God said so. He got, and when he was a hundred years old, he was still praising God stronger every day. Wow. He had the promise of God anchored in his heart. Why, it was a great miracle 25 years later than it was the day he promised it. That's right. He got stronger all the time. He never weakened, he got stronger. And if it don't happen right now or something takes place and you're perfectly normal and 10 years taken off your life, well, I don't know whether did I need him or not. What an excuse of Abraham seed you are. Right. You take God at his word and regardless of what the circumstances is, you still call God's word the truth. Hey, man. Yeah. That's old fashioned, sex, rest, backwood, scott, new sin killing religion, brother. But it'll help you. It won't whitewash you, it'll wash your wife. <laughs> it'll take all the roots that fit in this out and put not a wishbone but a backbone in you. And make you call those things which God said to be the truth in regards to what your criticizing neighbor or pastor might say. You say it's the truth. God said so, and God said it, that's right. I believe it. It's to me. The faith anchors in my heart, and I believe it, and I call those things that are not as though they were, because God said so. Then you'll see a revival sweep Saskatchewan till the people will be coming from England, from all over Europe, Asia, and everywhere else to come to the Saskatchewan revival. If these people riding here tonight would just take their hearts and sit on that one thing, God said so. What a revival. Don't just make it up in your mind. In your heart, say so. That's when you know it's going to happen. There is nothing can ever shake it. It's right there. It's going to happen anyhow. Abraham was not on everything he was called. When a man has got this kind of a promise given to him, he's asked to separate himself from unbelievers. That's what makes so many people fail with healing. Come down to life to form a miracle on him. And they get off amongst unbelievers and say, Now you're just worked up, dear. Now you know there's nothing to that. 
Now, that's just mental emotion. That's the devil. And the first thing you know, there's the devil coming right back. And you say, well, I, maybe, maybe I, 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 well, uh, right. that, there you are, right back the same condition, only worse. Right. Separate yourself. The Bible calls for separation. You know, when you go to choose your pastor, usually the people choosing your pastor, they want to choose a good mixer. Oh, we want a fellow that's sociable, that can do this and do that. God don't call for that kind of man. God calls for separators. Separate. Come out from among them. Separate yourself. You take a lot of times people choosing their pastor. I don't know what you do it. You're not down in America. They got a lot of Hollywood evangelism. Little sissified boys, it's a shame to say what truth is. A lot of pastors are afraid to tell people where they're standing on account of their meal tickets. Brother, what we need today is to take off your coat, roll up your sleeve, and preach the gospel with the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't mean a bunch of fanaticism. I mean an old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, God-sent revival. That's what the world needs. Not so much this Hollywood carry-on. Paul, God's word right, and the devil's wrong. Make it right and wrong. Sometimes we see those things in our churches. But Abraham, he walked on. He separated himself from all his associates. And God told him, Now you will sojourn in a strange land. And every man that comes to Christ has to sojourn among strangers that used to be. You used to not like to go to church and associate with the people who love the Lord. But whenever you take God at his word and receive his promise, then you change your association. The boys down at the pool room ain't got any more on you no more. You won't play cards. You don't drink. You don't act like you used to. You separated. You crossed the line. Come over to your places and become a Hebrew, a called out. And, and he was asked to sojourn in a strange land among strange people speaking strange languages. But he did it because he believed God and wanted to be inherit the promise that God had given Oh, I on my heart. I just preached too long. I just feel like I could almost preach right now, sure enough. And to think of the little time that we have. We'll hit the high places for a few moments. Now we'll notice Abraham as he came out and become a sojourner in a strange land among strange people. And first thing you know, he had someone with him who was lukewarm. Lot. Lot was his nephew. And it's lukewarm. You know the red hot Christian and the lukewarm Christian can't dwell together. That's right. That's what's the matter today. That's what makes the, the church the way it is. We're just getting into that lady of sin church age. It's just lukewarm and God said it makes him sick at his stomach. He'll spew you from his mouth. Right. Just enough religion to go out to church and sit like a wilted flower. <laughs> That's right. Whether we ought to have an old fashioned red hot prayer meeting and a testimony meeting and men and women out praying and house to house working on the street and doing something for God. We've lost our zeal. We've lost our love. We've lost what the things that God gave us. We let it slip out of our hands. And a bunch of so-called, you, you went out to a lot of noise and instead of the real old-fashioned gospel. If there's a Negro in here, I don't mean to make remarks about them, but an old Negro man one time, and this is not a joke. I don't mean to joke, because this is no place to tell jokes at the platform. This is a place to preach the gospel. But to get this point that you might see, an old Negro man one morning just kept saying, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He didn't preach at all. He just kept hollering hallelujah. When he got home, his wife said, Parson said, I want to ask you something. So what make you holler so much this morning? He said, honey, what I didn't have in right, and I had to make up in thunder. And I think we had a lot of thunder instead of so much real, pure, holy, unadulterated gospel teaching. If it had been so, then the church would have been solid on the rock by Jesus and should be moving on. <laughs> That's right. It might scorch a little, but I'd rather be scorched now than burnt forever. So just really know that it's the gospel truth. Now, when Abraham then, this little fellow on living lukewarm, they come up with fuss. That's the way it usually does. You take a lukewarm member, and the first thing you know, they'll pop the chewing gum a while and look over and say, Now, oh, if Sally will that kind of hat to church tonight, you know that's not right. <laughs> Here we start. That's it. If you thought Sally was wrong with that kind of hat on, why didn't you go play for her? And she didn't straighten up and take her out to one side and put your arm out and say, Sister dear, I want to ask you something. Talk to her like that. That's showing more Christianity than it would be to raise a little cult or a little friction in the church. Any Christian would do that. But then 
What did Abraham do? He started pressing for Abraham to now what? Before we have any quarrels between us, you suffer yourself for me and I from you. Now you look any way you want to. You take your choice. That's the way a Christian does. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Take your choice. You go east, I'll go west. You go north, I'll go south. And I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Well, right quick, that backslider, he wanted to look for the easiest road. So he looked over and he seen Sodom. Well, the waters of Jordan swept through there with a paradise almost like Eden. So he said, I'll take this way and leave his poor uncle with all those cattle and things out there on the barren land. But Abraham, when Lot separated himself and God saw that great move that Abraham had done, that great thing that he had submitted himself and gave his brother the benefit of the doubt and took the poor part and let Abraham go on with his big fire, uh, I mean, lots of great fines and things like that as he went out and perhaps to come to marry the city and set in the gate to be the judge and his wife become the leader of all the societies and everything down there the way she lived. But you know what God said to Abraham? He said, Abraham, rise up! Amen. Amen. I know you think I'm crazy. Maybe I am, but just leave me alone. I feel better this way. So he said, rise up, Abraham. Look around. So look to the east. Look where it stars and south. So walk to that land because it's all yours. Amen. Look it over. That's what's the matter with Christians. That's what's the matter with people. You don't know what you own. You know, if somebody give me a, the Bible, this blessed Bible here is your possession. Everything that God promised in here is yours. It belongs to you. But maybe you say, well, the Lord saved me, please, Lord. I'm glad that I don't know about the bank. I don't know about these things. Ma, could you buy a house without looking to it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> buy anything. I want to look around. Yeah. You know, the, the Holy Ghost is like a great big arcade. You know what an arcade is? And you're baptized into it. And if I own the arcade, I'd like to go around the shelf and see what I own. That's right. Look around, look at this. If something seems to be a little high, get me a ladder, climb up to it. Look around and see what belongs to me. And that's the way you ought to do as a Christian. Look through that Bible. See what the promise is. Every one of them is to the believer. Amen. Remember we used to sing the songs before we back said, Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. I'm trusting in his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. Right? Yes, it's yours. But if you're sick, God said it heal you. If you're worried, God said he'd give you peace. If you're a sinner, God said he'd save you. If you've been saved, he said he'd give you the Holy Ghost. Peter said so in the gospel on the day of Pentecost, said, Repent every one of you, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because the promises unto you and to your children and to them that fall off, all the way to Prince Albert, and as many as the Lord our God shall call. How can you take the best of the Holy Spirit out of this age, then? If ever God's still calling, he's still giving the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. That's the truth. All right. All right. The promise is to them that believe. One fellow said to me, and I said, oh, preacher, I, I, I don't believe in divine healing. I said, well, you're an unbeliever. It's not for you anyhow. It's just for believers. <laughs> That's right. It isn't for unbelievers. It's for them that believe. Amen. That's what salvation, the Holy Ghost, is for them that believe. Not for them that believe not, but to him that believe us. <laughs> That's right, it's only for believers. And everything God promised in the book, we want to take his word and say it's the truth. Anything contrary, say it's a lie. Let every man's word be a lie and mine be truth. That's what God said. And Abraham's children believe that. It's become God's children through Christ. Receiving the same spirit that was on Christ comes on the church. Can you drink the cup I drink, he said to the woman? The one her sons won one place night? Yes. Can you be baptized with the baptism that I've been baptized with? Yes. And he said, you shall. That's right. A double potion shall come up on you. That's true. Like the garment of Elijah that fell upon Elisha, a double potion. The Holy Ghost come up on the church, and these things that I do, more than this shall you do, for I go to my Father. It's God's promise. You're just afraid to claim it. But just like a little girl that wants something from her daddy, a little boy, they say, Daddy, will you give your right, Daddy? You make him the promise, you'll keep your word. How much more will God keep his word to his children? You might make a promise and you can break it, but God can't break it because he can do it. And he won't promise to tell he got the strength to do it. And Abraham said he counted him that he was able to keep his promise, and that's the reason he believed him. 
What are you counting him at tonight? To keep his promise? Then we find out after that, Abraham said, Lord, I'm almost a hundred years old now. I still believe you. Now, how am I going to know that I'm going to receive this promise? And look what he said. He said, Abraham, come out here. I want to confirm this promise to you. Oh, I love that. God always confirms his word. He confirms his promise. Say, so come out here, Abraham, alone to yourself. I want to confirm my promise to you, my covenant. And I listen real close. And he said, go get me a heifer of three years old. You get me a sheep goat three years old, and you get me a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a pigeon. And Abraham went and got them, slew them all, and he cut the, the heifer and the sheep goat and the ram he cut them apart in the middle, but he didn't separate the dove and the pigeon. Why? They were both offerings for sickness. Always the, the, the dove was an offering like Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest and offer the offering Moses required. And it was offered two turtle doves for the cleansing of leprosy. And some of them is run, overrunning water, and how one was killed, the other, the blood upon the other, and so forth for our cleansing, for healing. And now look, the reason he cut these in two because the covenant of salvation had been claimed between the Old Testament and the New Testament upon the different sacrifice, upon the one sacrifice, upon animals, and the other upon the Son of God. But the death, the healing, has always been based upon the faith of the people. That's the reason he could not be separated. Now, watch this sort of almost make the Pentecostal shout. Notice, even as far off as they are, Watch what happened. He cut them in two, and he said, Now, Abraham, watch the birds off of them that they, didn't, that they didn't come down to eat the carcasses of the beast until the sun was going down. And when the sun was going down, I listened close, God caused a deep sleep to fall on Abraham. In other words, Abraham, there's nothing you can do about it. The covenant is still unconditioned. And I'm going to do it, so I'm just going to put you out of the picture. You go to sleep. And when Abraham went to sleep, showing that it was nothing he could do, he couldn't stop eating meat or keeping days or doing this or doing that or trying to merit himself something or being sprinkled this way and baptized backwards and up and down trying to merit something. It's the grace of God that does it every time. It isn't you, it's God. So Abraham, you're not even in the picture. I'm going to do this. I'm so glad that he does. I just like to just believe him and follow him. After all, he's got the right to say yes or no. I'm so glad that he saved me, aren't you? And he never got it because I was any good or you was any good or we merited anything. He'd done it because he loved us. That's right. We never loved him. He loved us. We couldn't change our nature no more than you could tell a pig that he was wrong eating a manure pile. Well, certainly not. I wouldn't think nothing to see a pig eating a manure. That's his nature. But I'd hate to see a dead. I'd see a lamb eating in the same diet. And what gets me is I, I don't condemn a sinner for what he does. That's right. The sinner's all right. If he wants to drink and grouse and fuss and carry on stew, that's his business. Go on. That's your business. But you that call yourselves Christians and then do the same thing the sinner does. That shows your nature hasn't been changed. You're still a pig. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. right. I don't mean to hurt you. I want you to be cured. You know, you have to rub the scab off sometimes to get the thing to heal up right. So that's what the gospel does. It gives us an old-fashioned rubbing down. Then it pours some burning alcohol or something in the back of it to kind of make it burn a little bit. Now, notice what he did. Then he said, Abraham, I'm taking you out of the picture. You have no more to do with it at all. And Abraham went to sleep. And when he did, the first thing he saw before him was a real black darkness, death that faces every person. It was once the point on a man to die, and after this the judgment. A hard darkness, hard, shaky. You had a hard head. A darkness come before Abraham. But after that, he looked and he saw a smoking furnace. Every sinner deserves to go to hell. God's confirming his covenant now. Watch. And then after the smoking furnace, 
he saw a little white light, salvation. And this little white light went up to these beasts and went right in between each one of these beasts, making the confirmation of the covenant of Abraham, this little white light. What was he speaking of? In a symbol, if you're spiritual-minded, you'll pick it up right quick. It was Christ he was speaking of. Every one of those animals, every one of those birds, them beasts, everything, spoke of Christ at Calvary. Now let me get it to you a little bit uh, so you can understand it. In uh, Canada, what if you and I in Canada or anywhere in America was going to make a covenant with one another? I'd say, sir, will you do a certain, certain thing? Yes, Brother Bram, or I'll do a certain thing. Let's shake hands. You reach over and get his hand, shake hands. That's a covenant. Confirming it. Yes, sir. It's settled, is it, boy? It's settled. That's the way we do it, isn't it? Now, in Japan, when they make a covenant, it's a strange thing, but they get a little cruise of salt. And they get out there and talk the covenant over, and one gets some salt and throws it on the other and throws salt back on him. Now, that's confirming a covenant. But in the Orient, back in... The Bible becomes a new book to you if you're ever in Palestine and in the Orient, the eastern country. It's an eastern book. It's just a new book when you see it in the light of the Eastern people. And in this day, how a covenant was made, what they did, they taken um they taken a beast and killed it. They killed the beast and they wrote the covenant out on paper or a lamb skin, wrote it out on here, and they took that put the part up over this dead beast's body. One man took one piece, one man took the other, and took an oath to God that if they broke this covenant between them, let their body be like this dead beast. What a binding covenant. And that's how the God confirmed the oath to Abraham. Now look, when Christ was on earth, the Son of God, which Isaac, the promised one of the child, how did he know he was going to have it? He was speaking to him what he was going to do by the killing of these sacrificial beasts speaking of Christ. And what did God do at Calvary to confirm the covenant? He took his own son to Calvary, and on Calvary's cross, he tore him apart. He said, Father, into thy hand I command my spirit. And he, God went the spirit from the body, and he took the body up to glory. You believe that? Right. Sitting at the right hand of his majesty, and sent the Holy Spirit that was in him down to the church to confirm and to do the same things that he did when he was here on earth, to write the covenant on this and to that. And brother, the only way in the world that the covenant will ever be kept or be kept is when you and I receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost that God tore Christ apart and sent the Holy Ghost down for you and I. Right. The only way we'll be able to go up in the rapture is when that body comes to receive a spirit again of uh, raptured people that's in the covenant and the covenant is the circumcision by the baptism of the Holy Ghost that's Abraham's seed. Hey, man! I feel like shouting myself. Man! God made the promise and he tore Christ apart at Calvary. On Pentecost, he sent the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit that was in Christ is in you and you're a new creature. And the rest, Christ said, that I do shall you do also even to the end of the world I'll be with you. Hallelujah! Oh, my! That's what I think of it. To see how perfect it is if the Scripture lays on it. You may think I'm excited, but I'm not excited. If you felt like I did, you'd do the same and act the same. Look, friend, God made the promise. God sent it back, and here each night is confirming that promise. That it's the truth. God keeps His covenant. God confirms his covenant. When you see Christ going through the audience and doing the things that he did when he was here on earth, knowing like Abraham, knowing like Christ did when he was here on earth, the different things, the woman at the well, and all these things taking place the way they did, it's God writing on this second piece of paper, pulling out his church for his name's sake, that the same spirit was on this body up here, and this body is the raptured body that will go to meet this one. God took an oath by himself, for there's no other he could take it by, and swore that he would keep it. Hallelujah! Yeah. My 
Ah, ah, don't be scared of hallelujah. It means praise our God. He's worthy of every praise that could be given him. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. A woman the other day told me, said, Mr. Branham, you brag too much on Jesus. I said, I don't brag enough. <laughs> she said, you make him more than a man. I said, he was more than a man. Oh, oh she said, you're mistaken. He was a prophet. She's a Christian science. And she said, he was a prophet, but he wasn't. Uh, no, he wasn't divine. I said, he was either divine or the biggest deceiver the world ever known. She said, I said, if, his, if he wasn't Emmanuel's blood, if God the Father didn't overshadow that virgin and create a blood cell in her, right, that brought forth the Son, Christ Jesus, nobody, no man had nothing to do with that. God himself did it. And the blood's why we're redeemed. That's what's the matter with the church tonight. It's in anemic condition. It needs a blood transfusion from Calvary. Uh, the old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, back into the church again. Uh, Hellfire and brimstone preach to the scorching of the coattails of the believers. Oh. Amen. That's true. What we need today is an old-time St. Paul's revival in the Bible. Holy Ghost back again. Uh, uh, Correctly. What we need is some preachers that will get out and preach the truth of the thing. Now, if we notice this, how that God keeps his promise. This lady said to me, she said, Mr. Branham, if I'll prove to you he wasn't nothing but a man, I said, he was more than a man. I said, he was God. I said, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. I said, oh, no. He was Joseph's son. I said, he was God's son. I said, he was, he, he was divine. She said, I'll prove to you by your Bible that he wasn't divine. I said, I want to see you do it. She said, all right. In St. John the 11th chapter, the Bible said that when Jesus went down to the grave of Lazarus, he wept. I said, what's that got to do with it? She said, well, it shows he wasn't divine or he couldn't weep. <laughs> I said, woman, that won't work. I said, let me show you something. He was the God-man. He was both man and God. God was in him. I said, when he went down to the grave, that's right, he wept. That was a man. But when he drove that little step together, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, a man had been dead four days, stood on his feet and lived again. That was more than a man. That was God speaking out of there. Sir, I said, it's true. When he come down off the mountain that night, he was so hungry. He was looking around for something to eat. Looked on a tree and couldn't find nothing to eat. He was a man when he was hungry. But when he took five biscuits and two or three little pieces of fish and fed five thousand, that was more than a man. That was God. Hey, man. When he was out there on that ship that night, tossed about like a little bottle stopper, laying so tired and weak, virtue going out of him. In the back of that ship where ten thousand devils swore they'd drown him. And he's laying out there in the winds and the waves tossing around. And he woke up, they woke him, and he put his feet up on the bale of the boat, looked out, and said, Peace, be still. And there was a sudden calmness. The winds and the waves obeyed him. That was more than a man speaking. That was God speaking to those far lips. He cried for mercy at Calvary. That's true. He cried, My God, why has thou forsaken me? He died like a man, but on Easter morning, when the seals was broken and the Roman seal was torn apart, and he rose from the dead, he proved that he was God. That's right. No one he reported living, he loved me, dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rousing, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh glorious day. Amen. Water blind Fanny Crosby could scream out, Pass me that old gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Fall on others thou art calling, Do not pass me by. Thou art the stream of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? I'm so glad tonight that there is a covenant God has made with his people, the tearing of his son apart and setting him on his right hand and sending back the Holy Ghost to witness him unto the end of the world. Amen. Are you Abraham see? Do you believe? A little while the world sees me no more, yet you'll see me. For I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The second piece of paper, God's covenant with his church. And the same spirit that worked miracles and done signs and people drawed from him and everything is working right through the body of the church. The same thing tonight. He's the same. God's covenant with us, Christ. Christ is the seed of Abraham through Isaac. Amen. 
There you are. My, when Abraham was 99 years old, 17th chapter of Genesis, he was an old man now, nearly 100, 99, and Sarah was 90 years old. And here he was all drooped over, walking around. And the Lord said, Come here, Abraham. I want to speak to you. You've believed me for all these years. He said, I am the Almighty God. Amen. Yeah. Almighty there in the Hebrew is El Shaddai, which means the breast like a woman. The breast is not Shaddai, means single. Shaddai is a plural. Breasted. Abraham, I am the breasted God. In other words, you're old and your strength is gone. You, you're, you're as good as dead and Sarah's womb is as good as dead, but I am the breasted God. The only thing you have to do, Abraham, lay on my arm and just nurse your strength back again. Glory! Yeah. The same yesterday, today, and forever, New and Old Testament, the breasted God. Not breast God, but breasted God. He was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes. We were healed. Hallelujah. The breasted God. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, if he was that the father of Abraham, he's that to Abraham's seed. Right. If you need salvation, nurse your strength back. The baby, when it's all sick and it's afraid and crying, the mother picks the little fellow up. She holds him to her bosom. She coos to him. And the baby is nursing the mother's strength into its body and saving its own life. Not only is it saving its own life, but while it's being saved, it's satisfied. It quits crying. It quits running from pillar to post. It just lays there and nurses away and nurses its strength out of its mother. And so is it with every believer in God. If we have need of salvation or healing, we rest our eternal soul, our body, upon God's eternal Hallelujah. promise and just take a hold of God's Word and perfectly satisfied and call those things which are not as though they were and nurse away on God's promise. God, you promise it. I believe it and hold to it. Oh, God, Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that in Christ's name that you'll speak to this people, Lord, and let them know that you're still the Almighty, the breasted God. The one who made the promise, who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. Why, his very shadow upon the earth, like the moon to the sun. And the moon gives light while the sun is gone away. And so is the church to reflect the light of the Son of God while he's gone away. And someday... The moon will go down, and the sun will rise, and the both will blend together then. The moonlight and the sunlight becomes one. When the Son of Righteousness rises with healing in his wings, these old sick bodies will be made immortal. This soul that's tempted and tossed about will then be stable forever in the presence of God. Oh, Father, while we're living and watching and waiting, may we, with that eternal, blessed Holy Spirit that dwells within our hearts, and knowing that he's here to visibly show himself present, to do all kinds of wonders and signs among the people, as he did on the days that he walked in a corporal body here, he made the promise, and today we see him do the very same thing. Oh, God, may these people not, never forget that second piece of paper, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God took his life at Calvary and raised up his body on the third day and he sits there at the gate of the throne of God to make intercessions while the Holy Spirit was upon him as you're on the world to continue. And God tore him apart and put the Spirit upon the church to continue till he comes again. Father God, may these people, these lovely people here of Canada, realize tonight, Lord, that you're trying to get to them the honest gospel truth. Grant it, Lord. How much more could you do? What more, Father? There's nothing you could do. You said it in your word. You sent anointed man to preach it. And now you're here confirming it 
and proving it to be just as it was the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the covenant that he made with Abraham and his seed. Now, Father, we realize that many people are not Abraham's seed. You know, we realize, Father, that you said it was to the seed, not seed. And Jesus said, A little while in the world will see me no more, the seed. Yet ye shall the seed. For they'll recognize, they'll recognize the Spirit of Christ when he moves and shows that he is alive. And they'll rejoice and believe and call the things which are not as though they were because they take God at his word. Grant it tonight, Father, that the blessed Holy Spirit will move in our midst and do the things that Jesus did when he was here on earth, that at the day of judgment when I shall stand to give an answer, or give an answer and account for the message tonight, each one of us will have to answer then, Lord, may he come and confirm it, or we will be without an excuse. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Friends, don't think me to be rational, arrogant. No. But, oh, my. What a blessed promise and what a truth. Do you realize what sin is? The Bible said, go and disbelieve no more, or worse than this will happen to you. How many know that? It's true. Jesus said so. Remember the covenant. Remember the piece of paper. The covenant that God tore in two with Christ. Christ was both God and man. Do you know that? He was with the Holy Spirit. He said that you'd be baptized with the same Holy Spirit, not many days hence. And God cut him in two to make a covenant with us, swore by himself that he'd do it, and he told Abraham he would do it, and the covenant would be to him seed, him and his seed, Edward, and tore the thing in two, Christ and, at Calvary, tore him in two, raised up his body on the third day, set at the right hand as a memorial that God has swore himself. Now, can your heart ever beat away from it? God swore. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. God swore by himself, for there's no other he can swear by. I'll keep the covenant. I'll confirm it with any person that will believe it and accept it. And he said, I'll do more than that. A little while, I'll send back the Holy Spirit, which is the poor part from Christ, and he'll be with you, in you, to the end of the world, and the same thing he did when he was in this body, he'll do among his people until he comes again. Now, the Holy Spirit is here, and each night, we're not a great big number of people. We don't care to be a big number of people. We, I never want to be big, I want to be honest. If there, I never want to be great, I want to be sincere. I, 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 I want to love the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. I want to help the people. Now, the only way I can do it is tell you what the Word said. Then it's up to God to come and confirm that Word. Now, I want to ask you something. When Jesus Christ, God's Son, was here on earth, what kind of works did He do? Let's see what He did. He said, I do nothing till the Father shows me first by vision. Is that right? St. John 5, 19. No, he said, I don't do it myself. I do nothing. I can do nothing till the Father shows me first. People come to him. And all times, he even asked the boy one time that had epilepsy. He asked the father. He said, how long has he had it? Turn right around and tell another things that he told the woman where she had five husbands and, and told Nathaniel where he was when he prayed over under the tree and told Peter what his name was, said, your name is... It's Cephas, but it'll be called Peter, which is by interpretation a little stone and so forth. He knew their name. He knew where a feast was, had a coin in his mouth. And he said, I'll do nothing till the Father shows me first. Now, that Jesus that died, God's covenant, and raised again, that same Spirit was on him, is in the church, and promised for God that it would be to the end of the world. It's up to you to receive it. Now, I hope that the people never... <clears throat> Get in your mind that there's any man on earth with any sort of a gift can help you any more than to point you to the finished works of God at Calvary. I trust that you don't have them in Canada. It's too bad we have plenty of them in the United States. 
But we don't have them, I hope, in Canada. For any man that claims to be a healer and says God lets him heal the people, he's taken the virtue from the cross. A man wrote a subject here not long ago about blood pouring from a woman's hands and oil and stuff like that and said it's divine. I said, Brother, did you know that's antichrist? Did you know that's against Christ? If that's divine, what happened to the blood of the Lord Jesus? See? I said, don't go after those little fantastics. Stay with the Bible. Here's the Bible. God's put his word down here and will confirm it. You don't have to go off after such stuff as that. Stay with Christ. And any gift that points you anywhere away from Calvary, I, I, I don't say God couldn't do it, but I'd just rather stay with the word. <laughs> I really just know that God poured it. There's where it was finished. That's where it was finished for me. There's where Jesus said it was finished, and there's where I believe it. Amen. Now, the only thing you have to do, your healing, your salvation, was purchased at Calvary. You have to reach and receive it. That's the only thing. And then when you receive the promise, call anything contrary to that promise as though it was not, and God will bring it to pass. Amen. As the servant of the Lord, I give this promise through the word of the living God, and I know it's the truth. Watch him, what he's doing here in your midst. See the things that he's taking place. Now, we're going to call a prayer line and pray. Now, coming to the platform, as the people come, if you we're a little bit earlier, then we'll walk you to the platform. I know there's four or five different kinds of cards out here now, because we had three or four days already of uh, giving out cards. And um, uh, where is give some to speak with tongues. It's been very much misused, but it's a gift of God just the same. And he's give some interpretations. That's been misused, but it's true just the same. God has real. When you see a bogus, remember there's a real one that's made off of. Before, when you see a bogus dollar, remember that's impersonating a real dollar. When you see a false gift of per, something pretending, remember it's made off of a real one. That's right. When you see an old witch out here on the street of fortune teller, hold out your hands and oh, you or so-and-so, remember that witch is impersonating a real true prophet of God. That's right. When you see anything false, it's impersonating. It's Satan has perverted something and making a false conception of some real thing God has. When you see an old hypocrite walking down the street and you know they're a hypocrite, remember they're a pattern off of a real genuine Christian somewhere. You go to India and you find they want a clown for you, lay on spikes or walk through fire and, and everything like that, clowning. That's a hypocrite. Remember, back in that kingdom's back in there in the interior, there's a man who really suffers for his sins trying to atone for it. That's right. Where there's a false, there's a truth. Now, Jesus is true. Anything contrary to him or contrary to his word is false, in my way of thinking. Now, Christ made the promise. God swore that he would do it. God swore that he would do it. How many understood me say amen? amen. And God tore his life into at Calvary, promising and promised the Holy Ghost to come back and do the very same things that Christ did. And the Jews laughed and made fun of Christ because he could discern their spirit and tell them what was their troubles and so forth. And they said he was Beelzebub. And Jesus said, you say that against me, it'll be forgiven you. But when the Holy Ghost comes and does the same thing, one word against it, you're doomed forever in this world and the world to come. God promised to do it. And no matter how much people teach against it, God will do it anyhow because he promised he would do it. Jesus come not to show his authority, not say, here, I heal the sick to show my authority. He healed the sick to fulfill the word of God, the promise of God. And God's not healing the sick and showing signs and wonders here and things to show his authority. He's doing it because he promised to do it. Oh, God bless your heart. I wish I could, some way I could make you believe it. If there was, I'd... If, Taking a quarter and putting it on the floor here and pushing it in my nose all the way around this city, right down the street, pushing it in my nose and make you believe I start off right now doing it. I don't want to see you, friends. I, these people here, if I come back a year from now, they won't be here. You'll be gone. Uh, this crowd of people, and they're old and afflicted and so forth, you'll be gone. It's many of you. And I'll have to stand with you at the day of judgment and answer for what I speak of. So I've got to be real sure. Now, are they all lined up to the other cops?
some handkerchief. Or this, this, they want me to keep them here. Let's bow our head just a moment. Have one time when Israel was cornered into a corner, the Red Sea had them blocked off. One writer said that God looked down through that pillar of fire because God's path led through it, and the sea got scared and moved back and made a way for Israel to pass over to the promised land. Old mothers and dads and little children and wives and so forth are laying tonight sick and afflicted waiting for these handkerchiefs. Hear where your presence is. When these handkerchiefs is put up on the sick, may God look back through the blood of Jesus and remember his promise. And may the sickness depart from their body, and may they cross to the land of good health and strength. Through Christ's name I pray. And dear God, now I stand here before you. People are lined up. People are sitting in the audience. I've spoke the best that I know how, uh, telling the people of your goodness and your promise. Now, Lord God, will you speak and tell the people and let them know that I have told the truth. Confirm your word, Lord, with signs following. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. How do you do? Now, to everybody to step this mic up a little farther. Now, tomorrow night, the Lord willing, I won't take just a few moments to explain. The best that I can is supernatural. You can't explain it, but how this works. It's not me. You just disbelieve and it will never work. If Christ is standing right here himself and you didn't believe it, it will never work. When he comes to his own country, the Bible says he, C-O-U-L-D-N-O-T, could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. Any gift of God is operated by you, by the patient, by the people. It's not me. I don't know a one of you know nothing about you. But for instance, here stands a lady. I guess we're strange to each other, are we, lady? No. I, I do not know you. No. And God does know you. Well, now, for instance, what if Christ would appear here, which he can't in a corporal body, because every eye shall see him and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess when he comes. But he promised the second his spirit would be in the church and he would raise up people to do the same thing that he did to the manifest of the people that he's living and not dead. Now, if he was standing here tonight and if you're sick, if other needs you have, I, I don't know. I can say because I don't know you. But there's only one thing he could do is refer you back to the Word. And his Word gave a promise that he would be with us and would do the same things that he did. And when he was here on earth, he didn't claim to heal the people. But he knew their hearts as the Father would reveal to them. Is that right? Now, how many know that's the truth? Well, then, if Jesus of man, what is it? Humble yourself and submit yourself. Now, she has to submit herself. That woman might be a pretty sinner. I don't know. She might be an infidel. If she is, he just walked out heaven to her. How many of you remember what that guy did come try to hypnotize me? Sitting there trying to hypnotize me. Make me bark like a dog and leave on these army camps. They hard him to come in. And the Holy Spirit turned around and said, You child of the devil. But they attacked you out of here since they had two years now. Attacked you through me. Sure. Just watch what happens. Just, just submit yourself to God. Take off all your your doubts now and lay them away and never pick them up again. Say, Lord, I'm just going to watch. I'm going to pray. I'm going to believe tonight with all my heart. And just ask God to do it and see if he will. Sure he will. He's off of the way. Now, lady, you just look at me just a moment while we talk. Now, I'm going to give a little illustration, a Bible illustration for the newcomers in here. One day, our Lord Jesus went up to Samaria. And he sent the disciples away, and a woman came out to talk to him. And he said, uh, bring me a drink to the woman. He'd never seen her, she'd never seen him. Why, she said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask me Samaritan questions. That we have no demons. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. Why, she said, well, Jesus had nothing to draw with, and 
how could you do it, and so forth. And the conversation went on. After a while, he found just exactly where her trouble was. He said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. That's right. She got fired. She said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And we know that when the Messiah comes, which is Christ, when he comes, he'll tell us these things, all of them. But who are you? He said, I'm he. Now, if that was Jesus yesterday, and if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, it had to be the same Jesus today. Is that right? Do you believe that all? And if he will do it, and the, the, a woman and I have told this thing before God, the Bible, and the previous year, that we've never seen one another and know nothing about each other, and here we are standing here, and if Christ will perform that tonight, and you go away just believing, I'll take the stand in your place. Now, that's all I would know. But now, may the good Holy Spirit of God come as we yield ourselves to him in Christ's name and prove that he is living and here, and God has thy oath has kept his promise, and the Holy Spirit is here fulfilling the word of the Lord Jesus Christ just before his second coming and the ending of the world. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I just to talk with you, just as our Lord, because you're the first patient here. And I don't want to call you patient. I don't know. I can't say that. But I just said that just subconsciously said it. But you're the first person I'm to talk to. He don't have to tell me. He might not. But I hope that he does. But if he will tell me something in, in your life back, then tell you what's going to happen, you, you would believe it, wouldn't you? You promise that you believe? Yes. You do, you promise. Now may the Lord grant it. The audience is under oath that they'll believe. We're under promise and oath that we'll believe. Now it's up to him. See where I stand? Look at here, there's at least a thousand more people. And I made that challenge before. 500,000 heathens. Now, why? Because I believe him. I believe that he'll keep his word. And I, if you're sick, I couldn't heal you. You know it. It just has to be your faith in him. But it would raise your faith if he would come down and confirm and say that he'd be just like he did be. You know that that second piece of paper that I thought the covenant was God's word still moving. Now, if the audience is still here in our body, I see the lady walking up and down the floor. In the She's extremely nervous. She's got a few in trouble that bothers her too. That's right. And I see you a lot younger than what you look tonight. And you're something more than you're looking in a glass. And you got your mouth open. It's a swelling in the roof of your mouth. That's been many years ago. And it still happens today. Your roof of your mouth swells up. That's true. Yes, that's true. Another thing, you're always pulling up your neck. You have pain in your neck all the time. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I'm just thinking of you. You're the other thing. You've tried hard to believe. This is not the first time you've been faithful. You've come high enough to come. Jesus said, these things that I do shall you also 
Then it is God's sworn covenant truth. Is it sworn covenant truth? Yes. Then what we've got to be worried about? Jesus is here. His spirit is here. We're in a, what happened just now? I went into another world. It's an unseen world. We become so conscious of looking at one another like this. But there's this unseen world in which we're in the In which Christ. In this world, in this building here, are evil spirits. Wow! And Christians are not, and the angels of God are camped out and trying to inside in, to in them for faith. And here I'm standing here with healing myself, and the Holy Spirit is moving me. This is what we call heaven and faith in Christ Jesus. But remember, Satan always sets with the sons of God. You know, Always have someone with a skeptic idea. One would do that just he's trying to interfere. But Christians are always overcome. Now lady, my sister, ever what your trouble is, would you now accept Jesus as the healer of your trouble? Would you come up and just pray for you? Our kind Heavenly Father, with my hand to you and the other arm my sister. I pray that you will bless her and heal her. And make her well and give her desire of her. And may her testimony call the old fashioned revival to start in her church and neighborhood wherever she's found. Lord, thou has done everything now that can be done. And I ask that you will now with this anointing on our sister that she'll call the things which have been as though they were not and go on and live and be well. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. I believe with all my heart it's over. Oh, would you come? Is this the patient? Yeah, come. Uh, please don't go on to me. Just sit still a few minutes. I just feel something fixed to take place. God will honor His word. And when you move, see, every spirit, I'm kind of in contact with it. I'm watching to see what He'll do. Believe you, I know that's a bad part. Not what you call one of the people you believe. Just believe. That's all I'm saying. Just believe. Just believe. Now, the lady here, I suppose we're strangers to each other, are we? I don't know you. Never have seen you. You have seen me before. Probably up here at the platform or somewhere. Is that no one? Well, I just want to reach you. But I don't even know anything about you. I, I don't know. I think it's is that way what I mean. Let the soul, the audience can hold it. You're not someone that I know. See, I don't know what you'll say. I don't know what you're there for. I have no idea what you're there for. But he does. And I'm only trying to get the people to believe on the Lord Jesus. Not believe me, believe on Him. You had a, a lady's trouble, a female disorder. That's bad. Could be awful bad if something isn't done for them. It's extraordinary, please. And it causes you much trouble. That is right. You believe? That is true. Isn't it? You're just trying to get over those hump, right? There's something that just you can't feel right down in your soul. Just like that you didn't accept it just now. I'm not reading your mind, but you could hide your life if you had to. You're just as open to the Holy Spirit now. And it's all in the mercy of God. Maybe if I tell you who you are, you believe me, don't you? Aren't you losing belief? That's right. Don't you live at an address called 553 22nd Street East? That's right, isn't it? Now you do, you only live with one. Lord bless you. Father, God bless the woman in Christ's name. Lord. Do you believe, lady? 
I, I don't know you. I've never seen you. But do you believe that Christ is here to make you well and to give you the desire of your heart? I have no idea what you're standing there for. But you remember my sermon, the second piece of paper, the cover, God poured loose and cut his son up to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit down to do the same works of the Lord Jesus? And if you're standing here, that's the same thing he done. The people out there are all being healed just the same as you are here. You believe that? Church. What do you think about it, church? That's not really. You got power, huh? You believe in Jesus Christ in any way? You said I'm going to do it through the second house. You believe in Jesus Christ in any way? You do? You believe in God in any way? If you do, you know, and you may not believe in Jesus Christ. Have they? Praise. What about you? I don't know. You got to do it. You believe God in any way? If you do, do you? You believe it? God will give you that whole world? If you do, raise your head up, raise your head up, raise your head up. Are you ready? Go on, are you ready? See how easy it is? How easy you can just believe it? Perfect. Now you believe it? But you didn't come to be prayed for. You come to stand for somebody else. That's the man. It's your uncle. He's crippled, isn't he? Is that right? Do you believe now? Thank God for your hand. Thank God for everything that you ask for. I'd like to ask the blessing. Kind of Father, I pray that you'll give the maid the very thing that she asked for. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. All right. Would you bring me the patient? Are you ready? How do you do, lady? You believe it all your heart? You believe me to be his servant? I see the angel when he met me said, you get the people to believe you. That he's sincere when he pray. See what I mean? I try to follow his instructions just as close as I can. Now, the whole thing here begins to... S- it's you doing it. It's not me. But you know something's happening, isn't it? If you're aware that there's something stuck in here, you're going to be a real Because just as soon as the light, I've seen it suddenly, the tears started in her eyes. Now you're suffering with a real nervous condition. You've been nervous, upset. In your heart, you've had some excitement. You're here for somebody else. That's a very good person, isn't it? It's your daddy. You, if I tell you what matter with him, would you believe he'd be God's prophet? And you accept his healing through Christ as his daughter from there? The heart attack. That's right. Is that right? I see him almost dying. He's very weak. Now you go as I stand you. Kneel down and pray for him. I'll pray for him here. God will heal. Do you believe him? Will you always stand you? Father God, with a faith tender heart and come moving up, believing that you're here to make the sick well. And her reaching and getting a prayer card and was called into this line, not even for herself, but for someone else. God, I pray, as she's standing for someone else, what a Christian act to know that Christ would for us all. When we were guilty and unworthy, Christ took our place. And I pray that you will grant her to her request. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. What about it, little lady? Lift your little boy up. When you pick that child up, you want to pray for it, don't you? Right? You need prayer yourself. Your trouble's in your side, your right side, isn't that right? You believe me? You're set straight from me, no spirit between you and I, but the Holy Spirit. Your little boy's got a rupture, isn't that right? 
I've never seen you in my life, as I know of. We're strangers to one another. Well, I'll tell you something. You name that baby after my boy. His name's Billy Paul, isn't it? You believe you be God's prophet and receive what you ask for in Christ. Amen. Oh, living God, move, heavenly Father, let the people be awake and quickly to know that this is the day of the living The Spirit of living God, we love you. I'll be ready, friends. You never know. You'll never know the sacrifice. I hope you wouldn't think I was a hypocrite. But it seems like now after those visions, it's just, I'm just shaking, looking at the frustration on top of my hand. This is weakness. And looking at me like they can't see very far back in the audience. It looks kind of milky. What is it? It's two worlds that are laying between them. The people is moving, drawing. But you bring someone else, sister. How do you do, lady? You believe me to be a servant? I don't know you. Christ knows you. You believe what I preach tonight is the truth? You do? That Jesus, the Son of God, is here in the form of Spirit to do the same things. And you believe that to him? If you believe that, that heart trouble that you've been bothered with for me. You believe it? Your eyes are going bad to you all the time. That's right. And you're extremely nervous. Isn't that true? Now that you might know that I was God's prophet, there's somebody here with you tonight who wants to be prayed for. That's right. That's your husband. That is right. If I tell you what's wrong with your husband, would you believe me to be his servant and believe that Christ is standing there? That me, a man, would know not these things? I see your husband can't sleep at night or something. There's something bothering him. He's up and down all the time. And that's caused by a nervous condition. And it's right under his eye. I see him moving in his eye. It's right under, isn't that right? Raise your hand if that's true. Then do you believe God? Then do you Come on. Jesus died and said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. If you were here tonight to call the body, we would all fall at your feet. But the woman, believing that the cup of the God, she's brought herself to the platform, and she's respecting you, Lord, as she's praying and weeping here, holding my hand. And as your servant, her brother, I ask for these blessings that he may be made whole in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, my dear sisters, and may the blessing be with you. Young fellow, I want to ask you something. What if I should say a word to you and just pray for you? You believe you'll be well? You do? Come here. You receive when you pass the corner. Father, I thank thee for thy goodness to the man. And I pray now that you'll bless him and ever keep him in the perfect condition in Christ's name. God bless you, brother. Just on the road rejoicing and being happy. You believe? Yes. Would you accept me as his servant? Yes. Not as him, but as his servant representing him to you. And then if he had sent me to represent him, then my prayer would help you with if an ambassador went from Canada to, to Russia, and if the Canadian government had sent him, all the governments behind him, is that right? If we come representing his ministry as cowardly, and the death of the Lord Jesus, then all heaven is behind the world. Is that right? Now, it's, but God has made it basically that it's your faith that does your healing. Now your condition, I know, your healing has been completed. What about your faith? Would you believe it? All right. From being a, a nervous type of person, you've caused yourself to have an ulcer in your stomach, a stomach condition. That's right. Isn't that right? You can't eat. But now go eat you a good fat hamburger. Enjoy your meal. At the face of the Lord Jesus. I'm
lot of people. But Jesus Christ is the Savior. Do you believe that, my brother? You do? You now will accept him in every way and believe that God will remove every doubt and fear from you and Christ will let you live. And will you live for him with all your heart? Come here. Dear Heavenly Father, as I hold myself to this man knowing to see the shadow following him, and as Elijah put himself upon the body of the dead baby, I pray, God, that you will hail this, our brother, and grant his blessings through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Go on your road rejoice and forget all about if you were sick or anything that happened or what more. Oh, nervousness is a bad thing. Christ is a healer. You believe that, don't you, lady? Amen. You believe he'll make you well? Amen. With all your heart, let's bow our head. I want to show you something, lady. Everyone out there suffering with nervous condition, raise your hands. I'm not sure what's in this crowd like that. That poor, you just can't call me so many of them there. Now believe with all your heart. Heavenly Father, in the name of the beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, I challenge every unclean spirit, every devil, and ask that it leaves in Christ Jesus' name. May every nervous person in this building be made completely whole at this time. In Christ's name I ask that. Amen. God bless you. Go rejoicing, go and happy. Let us say praise the Lord. Everybody. And we rejoice in the exceeding abundance of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, come up. All right. Everybody ready? Let's oh yes. All right. Heavenly Father, I pray for the little lad and ask that you will heal his eyes, make him well, bless his loved one here, and may this all be to God's honor and glory through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Don't doubt, believe, you be well, everything normally and well. Let's say praise the Lord. man is sitting looking at me in a chair. There seems to be a life around the man. Oh, I see. You have accepted Christ as your healer. Isn't that right? I don't know you. That's your wife sitting behind you. Got a back trouble. She wants to be healed also. Don't fear, have faith. Believe God. You shall have what you ask for. Little lady with her head sitting on her white hat on, praying, breathing cold, have faith in God. God can heal that sick vertebrae. You believe that? Little lady sitting there also praying back there with a red dress on. Got him in our trouble. You got all your life. Isn't that right? You believe Jesus Christ makes you well? All right. Go home and be well. In Christ's name. You believe the Lord's right of you? Believe you can go home and be well? Be second? Then go and be God. How many wants to be healed? He's here. I speak in the name of Jesus. The Holy Ghost is moving in here. I'll see you in heaven.